you for having me here. I really enjoy being uh, with all of you people. And uh, as I've already told to many of you, I'm a professor of English literature, mo mostly English, and most of my teaching is actually dealing with literary studies. That is so because I come from Serbia where translation, as in many other cases, is not recognized as, as uh, an academic uh, specialization that you can get a degree or PhD from. I was wondering even what would happen if someone came with a translation degree and tried to get the, their degree recognized. Probably not very, uh, it wouldn't get very far. So uh, the issue is that we do have a lot of interest in translation studies, but we do not have the formal framework within which we can operate in, in terms of research. And uh, this, uh, what I will talk about today, will be related uh, to some point, or to, to some extent, to that. Uh, namely, I get a lot of students from uh, the English Studies Department, Master Studies, who are interested in translation, but we also have a Master's in Translation, which has just started, and which is primarily training-oriented. But in order to be an academic master's, uh, it has to have this academic component which involves research. So we have to balance out the student expectations and the legal requirements, and in that, that students need... Sorry? <laughs> now it's funny. <laughs> okay. So, um, it's okay. So we need to balance out student expectations because students primarily come for training and they want to be translators and interpreters, they don't want to do research and that's a completely different field. And on the other hand, they cannot get a degree unless they do their final uh, paper in research. So most of them uh, find the translation histories as a sort of a good compromise that they can handle with their backgrounds because so far we have had mainly students coming from philological backgrounds. This year is a bit different. We have a student who is coming from law and she has a completely different story, so this probably wouldn't apply to her. Okay, so this is where we start. So the first part of this talk will be dedicated to how to actually guide research using, or research training using uh, translation history. And my, uh, what I've done so far is based on the, the article by O.T. Paloposki that she also uh, offers some solutions or some uh, uses for translation histories. And uh, this is one of the sentences I found in a book that is actually dedicated to audiovisual translation. It's by a Greek author and uh, it seems quite obvious when you look at it. So hypotheses are generally triggered by observ observable phenomena. That's what I like to ask my students to do. So observe, find something that you're interested in. But the key word here actually for them is observe while it should be triggered. So you're not, you shouldn't be happy with just observing. You have to do something more. So where, where and why history comes in handy or history, uh, historical studies of translations. So for uh, coming from such a, an area, I wouldn't say country because it sort of changed and it would be ridiculous to talk about history and stick to the present borders. So a translation actually uh, happens as a marker of a lot of historical uh, events or marks or comes in simultaneously with a lot of historical events. And it also over, uh, signals changes in cultural uh, setups and also changes in language, which becomes quite obvious with uh, the examples. So translators uh, acted in history as social agents and that's that's undeniable, although it did change in the 20th century, so when translator became a profession, translators uh, up till, I don't know, 1950s were people with different professions uh, who actually had professional training in different occupations. Also, of course, we're looking at what is translated or what is not translated. That will be the second part, or what is being cut in translations. And who are those people who uh, form uh, those translation clusters that appear in, we notice that they actually appear in clusters as well as retranslations. Uh, retranslations would be translations of the same work by a different translator. 
that could happen simultaneously. So there are also those uh, observations where exactly the same time or two years apart, there are two translations of the same play, for example, with no obvious reason. So it's very interesting to look beyond that. So what is it done for? Uh, for what purpose? As a general question, so I'll focus on uh, plays, on, uh, namely on Shakespeare, you'll find out why. Uh, most of the plays are meant to be uh, performed in the theater. But however, this, uh, what we found out was not always the case. So, and how the text was modified, what they did with the text is of course uh, the final aspect of what we look at. So some questions that are raised in the recent um, thought on history trans or translation histories. Uh, should we look at translation as the object? So should we just go into the text or should we use it as a sort of a lens to observe something else that was going on uh, in uh, that period? And uh, where should our focus be? And can we do both? That's what I wanted to find out. Uh, can we also see what that singular and specific would do for a general pattern? Does it apply to general pattern? Are we allowed to use it? Uh, and how far can we operate with those patterns? So what kind of patterns can we notice and how functional, how useful they are and uh, whether it applies? It's never, of course, mathematical precision, but uh, it is uh, somewhat of a pattern that did appear in this student research even, so I wonder what would happen if uh, we had a team of researchers who did it for, for, for real. And of course the question is, are the, those patterns of history or are those patterns of translation, so which prevails? So more reasons why we actually focus in uh, research training on translation history. So it provides something of a wider uh, education, broader knowledge of issues that actually translation is a result of or is a consequence of or is a part of. And it also extends uh, our students' views uh, on, on what they are supposed to know, uh, both as translators, those who are in for training and those who are uh, there for research. So how to tailor research training, what to do? We, of course, are considering methodology and what we are asking them to do, what the criteria for thesis examination should be, uh, what the needs of the students are in specific programs, and uh, what law requirements want us or ask us to present. Uh, currently, students are asked to present a research paper that would be uh, at least 50 pages long, which is quite long for those who come in for training. So that's uh, demanding task. And also uh, for those who are more interested in uh, getting a degrees that are more academic, how to present their research to different audiences, because as I said, translation is often observed as either part of literary studies or uh, as a part of applied linguistics, and people generally wish those labels be more prominent than translation studies labels, and it's very, sometimes very difficult depending on the profile of the conference. I just forgot that I could use this as well. So, <laughs> uh, the goal here is to construct uh, narratives of our own. So basically that provides, this approach provides access to create different narratives depending on the focus or the events or the, the episodes that we wish to choose. So to focus on different political, cultural and social contexts. It allows us to focus on human subjects, the translators, the publishers, the editors, and so far it has proven quite uh, fruitful to, to do so. And what is most important, and I find it uh, unique, is to uh, provide us with an insight what Oti Palopowski calls movement across space. That means actually, uh, not really excluding, but setting aside this binary of original and target, or source and target, and uh, sort of look for fragments for something unfinished, so how it came to be, to, to track the, uh, the entire uh, path, how the translation came to be. Uh, of course, uh, it becomes probably 
more obvious, I can't use this, I'm sorry. Uh, more obvious where the case study is. So the first case study is translations of Shakespeare in the 19th century and the period between wars. Uh, the reason why I chose this is, first of all, as Anna already said, whoever wants to do translation histories, they sort of first look at Shakespeare. Uh, and that is very common, so it will be abundance of material that you can also pro approach critically. <laughs> But what is another thing that we noticed is that translations of Shakespeare uh, have this funny sentence added to the front page. It says, translated from the original, and then it doesn't mention the text, the source text at all. So after a while, and after digging deep, because if you look at the virtual libraries, uh, only one kind of translations would be listed as trans translations of Shakespeare. Uh, after a while, you understand that the concept of the original at the time was something completely different for, from what we now understand, that there is no you know, one original text that you could quote. Um, so these are mainly student projects or student-oriented projects. And the second part would be, or second case study, would be on what happens or how we d d discover secret or covert practices of content control that were operational in the Soviet, uh, sorry, socialist uh, period in Yugoslavia. Uh, often that's called socialist translation practices. But uh, what we found out is that the results are not as straightforward as you might expect. So we've got examples from literature, popular culture, and critical theory, and a lot of contradictions that still need to be answered. So um, I think I might need, um, might probably should uh, explain so, uh, the location. <coughs> Geographically, uh, this is a country that doesn't exist, and I suspect you all know that. Uh, it no longer exists, but uh, it uh, existed for some 80 years or so. And uh, it was a country for certain Slavs. That was uh, the idea behind it. Uh, it had two periods. One was the period of kingdom, and the other was a period of socialist, uh, democratic, they would call, and federal Yugoslavia. And it uh, has some specific features. So one of the features that actually dictates uh, uh, or asks for the movement in space to be recognized is the common language, which is something that is always political. And here more so, uh, that because it not just only depends on ideology, but it also is very much uh, uh, something being misused, often misused, and where translation also signals this uh, aspect of mm, political abuse of language. So it will become clearer. So this is the blue area, is the area where people speak what used to be called Serbo-Croatian or Croato-Serbian language. Uh, these patches, this one's Hungarian, this one's Romanian, uh, this one's Italian minority, and of course Albanian, and I think Bulgarian as well. So a lot of languages of minorities were also recognized, all languages of all minorities were recognized, and in this area where I come from, there were 26 languages that were equal in the period of socialism, and they could equally be used in official purposes. That created a sort of a demand, high demand for translation at the time, but um, it's no longer so. But most of the people who went to school actually learned Serbo-Croatian language or the varieties of it and were exposed to uh, both Croatian and Serbian originate, <coughs> well, literature and culture production originating from both uh, predominantly Serbian or predominantly Croatian writers. Uh, here you find, uh, this is a new map, of course, a uh, new uh, map, political map, which also reflects today's uh, situation. But basically, this is the common language that you don't need to translate between, so we understand each other perfectly. Mm -hmm. 
Um, what happened in the period of the, uh, after, just after the Civil War was that in Croatia there was a rule that all foreign films need to be translated or subtitled. So they ended up subtitling Serbian movies, yeah. old Serbian movies, and uh, actually exchanging words pronounced on screen for synonyms. And people went to movies just to watch the subtitles, not to watch the movies and laugh at it, of course. So after a while, the practice stopped, but it was a political decision. Of course, the orthography and uh, um, a lot of things related to language was changed after the war in a manner that uh, uh, actually meant going back to some old, uh, not so uh, practical and not so uh, reality reflecting solutions in order to be different, so to pr prove your difference. Um, today, the map is a bit blurry, but uh, the light blue area, oops, sorry, light blue area is Croatian language. This a bit darker blue is Serbian language, with the exception that Montenegro has also Montenegrin language. And this purple or dark blue is Bosnian language. If you go back, it's exactly the same map and nobody moved, it's the exactly the same language, with uh, insistence on differences. So it's the same language, but we insist on differences. And there is this one area in Bosnia, which is called uh, Brčko Kanton. It's a sort of not belonging to either Federation or Republic of Serbska. I don't want to worry with the details, but they actually have a educational system that is different from both sides, and uh, they have um, languages, all three languages, all three languages in school where they insist on differences. So each of the uh, pupils will have their own mother tongue and plus two varieties where they actually explain how different they are. I, I got that from a girl who went to school there, so yeah, it, it is exactly organized in such a way. So this is contradicting to what Pim uh, pr uh, proposes that language is never uh, never coincides with social uh, boundaries or the, the national boundaries, so societies are either bigger or smaller than the language, but uh, p politics is still trying to uh, contradict it. Sorry. So what happens with translations of Shakespeare? So students go to virtual library and they get a listing, you see there are like 10 pages, at least 100 hits, maybe more, and they say, okay, so the first six are not really dated. I will open the one from 1859. And this is what it looks like. It's a translation published in a, a journal and it is a, in an old orthography, which uh, for those of you who can read Russian, actually resembles Russian. So that's one thing that uh, should be noted. That kind of uh, orthography is characteristic of uh, Serbian uh, community in Austro-Hungarian Empire because uh, that was kept in order to provide some kind of protection for language and um, the religion from uh, the attempts of assimilation or so it is claimed. Um, in the meantime, so first translations would be performed in Austro-Hungarian Empire and would be presented in this orthography, which is called Old Orthography. So if we look at translations in the 19th century, everywhere, so uh, this area included, uh, it had to do with national identity being uh, realized. So uh, the article by Edith Prunch, Priest Francis Farias Constructing the Professional Field of Translation, actually speaks about the symbolic capital of a prestigious language. So translations from a language that is considered prestigious is something that uh, offers uh, value <coughs> and power to uh, the culture. It is being considered target culture. And, uh, but at the time, most of the educated people in, in the empire were uh, educated in German and they could read uh, world literature in German. And uh, that's why the first translations were not novels, but plays, because plays were meant to be performed in theater, which was 
symbolically uh, an institution that was national. So each of the minorities wanted, or most of the minorities wanted plays, and Shakespeare translated for the purpose of proving that they have national institution or operative national institution, such as theater. Uh, so if we uh, actually look at what happens uh, in general approach of students, so British Isles to Serbia would be source and target movement that they would um, suggest from the observable phenomena that they just picked up in the virtual library. However, that kind of map completely disregards this map. This is the 1860 map of Europe. So most of translations were happened somewhere here. That was also Hungarian Empire. Serbia existed, but they didn't have the capacity at the time to, uh, exist as a, sorry, existed as an independent country, but uh, there were no people who could actually uh, work on translations and work on uh, cultural representation at the time. Uh, another thing that is very interesting and is related to the common language and should be uh, something that the students need to know is that in 1850 there was a signed agreement on common language but it was signed in Vienna and it related to all, all southern Slavs agree that Serbo Croatian or Croatian Serbian is their common language. So it was a, a, not a natural thing of course but it was a, an agreement consciously made for a specific purpose. Uh, both Croatians and Serbians in uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire had something called Matica that was a uh, cultural institution that was uh, founded to protect or to promote uh, cultural heritage and it was based in Budapest at the time the Serbian was based at, in Budapest at the time, and that's where first translations actually happened. So they didn't happen in Serbia at all. Uh, language reform happened in 1868, where we uh, actually got our new orthography, and then all of the translations were transcribed into new orthography. So who translated? Uh, the profile of the translator uh, what well, is very, very far from what we expect today. So most of these people here on the list uh, were poets, writers, diplomats, but also had a degree in law, the first two, and, uh, or in medicine. And uh, they uh, actually worked as uh, people in their professions and were also coming from a very uh, high, up high, um, high social status, so they're coming from rich families who could afford education and uh, doctorates in Vienna. And most of them are remembered for their literary production. Uh, Laza Kostic was one of the most famous poets in Serbian language, but he also is known for the tr first translations of Shakespeare, which were also very, um, sometimes very comic. So his uh, coins or new words that he made up were uh, remembered for trying to be funny. So uh, in that period, translations are usually and mostly and almost exclusively linked to the national revival and uh, to the gathering of the pool of works that come from foreign literatures which have this symbolic value and uh, to, to, in order to build a, a national policy system, if you wish, both cultural and literary. What happened between the wars? We noticed translation or retranslation clusters. This is a map of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, which looks quite different from the maps that I've shown uh, so far, but that was the desire of the king at the time to create a new nation that would not be Serbs, Croats, Slovenians, but that would actually constitute Southern Slavs as a nation. Uh, that's why the division of the borders appeared uh, differently. And why do we have so many retranslations again? So we notice that the profile of the translator changed. Uh, they tend not to be professionals anymore. There are some of them who re remain in medical profession, which is quite peculiar. There are a lot of people who combine literature and medicine. And uh, 
we also find that translation becomes uh, uh, something uh, of a desired object. So, like we had this uh, talk uh, or Daniel's announcement that a mimetic desire, there were fights. Uh, who is going to be the primary translator or considered better or uh, the quality of the translation comes into play? Some theoretical questions are raised. Uh, but we also know that there is a strong controlling apparatus of the state. So uh, a lot of stuff or a lot of uh, literature being produced is being censored, heavily censored at the time. Uh, mind you, this is considered democratic society in today's interpretations of history. That period is considered much better or much more open and much freer than the period of socialism, which is not founded on, on facts because the um, censorship operated as an official uh, policy. At the time, in the 20s, that was a period of creating an, of this new nation. And then uh, in establishing of the public system, we also had uh, writers who desired to be recognized as translators in order to, again, acquire that symbolic capital. One dispute is famous, so who's Hamlet? Uh, we have two translations of Hamlet in two years from two different authors, these two guys. Uh, the first one could speak English, that's documented, and he translated 17 Shakespeare's plays altogether. The second couldn't speak English, and that was well known, he can speak English, but he translated Hamlet. What uh, followed is a dispute that ended up in court, and uh, these are uh, pictures from a pamphlet that was published by the first translator, uh, claiming his authorship or claiming the other one to be the plagiarist. So he just took the translation and made it better, and that was his defense in court because he was the poet and he could do verse better than the first translator. But he found no reason to sign the name of the first translator or to even mention him. So just take the translation, make it better, and sign it again. Uh, that, that, there we detect the first issues that are actually um, concer concerning copyright and uh, ownership or authorship of the work. What happens, what's funny, is that uh, the second guy's so Sima Pandurovich translations prevailed after the war, after the World War II. So how has that happened? Apparently translations can be erased. How did it happen that the guy who couldn't speak English actually became the principal translator of Shakespeare in the 19, after the war, so the 1960s actually? You can erase translations. This was a translation by the first translator, so Svetislav Stefanovich. I will not trouble you with the names, I know it's difficult. And that is one not very, what turned out to be not a very smart decision. So he signed and authorized translation of Mussolini's corporate state, uh, fascist doctrine speeches, and they published it in 1937. That was the reason, sorry, why he was court-martialed, or not court-martialed, because he, was, he wasn't in the military, but he was sentenced to death uh, in 1944. So it wasn't even the end of the war, but uh, it suggests in the paper that there was a trial, but uh, there are no transcripts from any of those trials. And uh, this is the paper that lists 104 people who were executed in November 1944 for different reasons. So here is the note actually telling why this translator was executed. It says, Stefano is do Dr. Svetislav, he's a medical doctor that's becoming important. He's the ideologist of fascism, translator of Mussolini's state, a German, um, German Nedic, that's the lo uh, local uh, Quisling government, a commissary of the Serbian literary, uh, literary establishment. Uh, his, uh, counsel, he gave counsel to the Minister of Education uh, in that government. And he, he was also a member of German committee to slander Soviet government related to the German crimes in Vinica. So I don't know how many of you actually know what Vinica is. 
You know? That is a, a crime, war crime actually committed by the Soviet troops and uh, they executed, uh, I think, thousands of Polish officers in a, in a woods near Vinica. So Germans organized a committee to prove their, their innocence and uh, as a medical doctor, Stefanovich was a part of that committee. Uh, Soviets actually admitted to that crime quite recently actually and they apologized but he was executed. Most of historians believe for this. So the translation served as uh, uh, proof, uh, solid proof that he was uh, of the wrong ideology but in itself it wouldn't have been enough. So this, uh, this is how his translations disappeared. So all of his translations were, and he was the principal translator at the time uh, for Shakespeare, all of his translations were uh, gone. Something like oral, actually. But uh, the, how it ended up, uh, complete works of Shakespeare were published in the 60s. This is some of the second or third editions from 78. And his name was signed here. And all of the people who actually participated in the translation of uh, Shakespeare's works, but in the, until 1966, he was not a, a person, so he was gone. Um, one of the conclusions from this is that the translation clusters also uh, appeared in the periods where a uh, canon or a uh, national canon in Yugoslavia was unstable or was in the making. And uh, as it stabilized, the translations did not happen as retranslations, but reissues of the same translation. So from the 1960s on, we've got the guy who couldn't speak English, who was combined with a prose translator who couldn't do verse as principal translators of Shakespeare. So most of Shakespeare's play that are today uh, meant to be read by students or performed, they would be translated by the two of them. Okay, so that was about student projects. So what was going on in uh, the socialist period? And here I will not deal with Shakespeare. I will just stick to uh, the, the processes and mm, methods of social control. So some of the facts that you might not know. In 1948, up till 1948, uh, Yugoslavia was set up in a very Soviet kind of uh, socialism which did not allow much freedom for anything. But there was a dispute which uh, was pro probably, am I doing something wrong? No. Where 
demanding or protesting against socialist society that produced social differences. Uh, that uh, was considered for, actually, the smart way. They didn't fight the students directly, but it, the protest itself is now seen as uh, very dangerous and very uh, unwanted kind of uh, opinion, which pointed to some aspects that, well, were not going to be corrected, that nobody wanted uh, really to correct. Uh, in the 70s, so not immediately, but in 74, there is a backlash of conservative party members. That was exactly the place where everything was being cut down, but in a very subtle way. So they didn't do that through courts and through bans, but they did it in a more grassroots way. And of course, in the 1980, Tito died, and the economy was really struggling by that time, and nationalists prevailed, and the results, you, you know. So, uh, ideological framework for the socialist Yugoslavia meant that it was uh, going to develop independently from the USSR. Uh, some features of it were democratic. So there were democratic elections after the war where the people decided that the king should not be returning to the country because he left the people. Similar thing happened in Italy actually. Uh, Women had equal status, it was more or less welfare state, it, everyone had uh, rights to work, or so they would say. Uh, and uh, mother tongues or languages had equal status. Some of it was also forced, of course. So some of it was done for the sake of doing it. But uh, still this uh, equality is something that was uh, primary in deciding on anything. Some features were totalitarian, there was just one party and nobody really was interested in um, participating in elections. We did have elections, but you know, you have one party, you have one list of candidates and uh, the choice seems obvious. Tito was uh, president for life and uh, party members sort of were present in all spheres of life and you can do much if you're not a member of the party. And the, all of the media were state-owned, and that posed the problem already in the Civil War because the trust in media was <laughs> absolute and uh, the, nobody was actually aware of the control and manipulation, what you can do with the media. Underlying differences that actually this country uh, had since it was formed uh, were suppressed, and one way to suppress them was to promote state atheism from primary school. So that meant that it, atheism was a kind of a state religion. So you're not allowed to f celebrate religious holidays. You are not really not allowed to go to church, but um, you should not be talking about it. You know, that was the idea. Uh, and also in all public spheres, especially in education, all kind of religious content was suppressed. But how? So we have assumptions about content regulation and control that actually tell us that it is done by legislation, that government agencies function as censors. So we have a body that actually controls what uh, should or should not be published. And that there would be some kind of paper trail telling us that what was going on and why. And that there is like censor and the censored as two opposed parties. So a binary relationship between two, the two. Censorship is a restrictive technology, so something that would restrict freedom of speech. Uh, censorship and freedom are the opposites. And socialist and communist societies by default had ideological control over content and production of translated materials. Yes, but no. It wasn't really done consistently. So what it turns out to be is a process that actually involves a lot of agents and uh, translators, writers, uh, so someone who participates in the production of the work as much as the censor actually participated in what uh, is going to be presented or not presented. And translations and retranslations we can use to detect what was going on at a particular period uh, in time. So if we look at the laws, we can t actually not determine anything. The laws don't mention control of any kind. 
it's except for this one, the first one. Uh, that is uh, the law that was written uh, according or based on the, the uh, Soviet law and that actually did say that children's and uh, youth books have to be heavily controlled. That one was abolished in the 1950 and uh, we had different kind of laws but none of them actually mentioned control or censorship or censorship agency or any kind of agent that would act, act as a control. So we don't have clearly defined cri criteria and we have something as grassroots censorship, so the printers, the typesetters, were at one point uh, people who refused to set something that they found was not ideologically appropriate, so that's how one of the journalists was killed. Uh, we have unwritten rules that are commonly known and all of the professionals working in the field knew what they are supposed to or not supposed to do, which of course constitutes auto-censorship or self-censorship. And we have an institutions, party officials who are at high positions uh, where they decide. So sometimes they decide, sometimes they don't. Uh, so I prefer this definition of censorship, which is not that related to socialist uh, or any other ideology, but I find is present almost everywhere. So definition of the term encompasses all socially structured prescriptions or prescriptions which inhibit or prohibit dissemination of ideas, information, images, and other messages through society's channels of communication, whether these obstructions are secured by political, economic, religious, or other systems of, of authority. It includes both overt and covert proscriptions and prescriptions. If we use this definition and look at the same period, <laughs> I keep hitting this, sorry. Uh, we look at the same period in different ideologically or ideological setups, we will probably find that this was in operation everywhere. So content control, we have to come to a conclusion is a part of translation culture. So it actually exists not only as Niki Pokorn says, in socialist states, but also elsewhere too, and is present today very much so. So how it looked. The case of Robinson Crusoe, you know the book? It's not a very interesting book to read when you're 12, and that's, <laughs> you're laughing, I know. Uh, so uh, when you're 12, and that's a part of children's reading list today, what it used to be is adults uh, book, so book meant not to be read by children, and in the process of being adapted for children, a lot of it was cut. But it, we could say that it was because of censorship, because sometimes really religious parts are missing, to that point that it makes no sense anymore. When you read it, uh, uh, they're actually ruining the structure of the novel. But we have in the 1950s two translations, one with almost all religious elements deleted and the other with the text complete. So that's a contradiction that still remains to be solved. Uh, it is not therefore uh, up to a, a, a for, uh, outside agency or to someone else probably that was done by the translators for different purpose. It could be that they were protecting them ideologically but it could also be that they wanted the book to be presented to different audiences. Um, 1984 is a book that was banned in East Germany. We had a translation published in the 60s and we issued per periodically. It was a hit book actually. This is the, the edition from 1984 in Belgrade. They also had a new Croatian translation done in 83, so it wasn't cut, it wasn't touched at all. But this film was released in the 60s with no Jesus in it. So, yeah, it was a, a, an action movie at the time about Romans. We didn't know it was about Christian religion. What is interesting, the novel has been translated in the 20s and in the 30s and in the 50s again, and it wasn't cut. But the film was heavily cut. Uh, this is a cover of an LP record in the 80s, Simple Minds. Um, and uh, in, in, in light of uh, previous talks, I was wondering, could this be interpreted as a resemblance translation? It resembles. 
but also lax. You see, the cross is missing because they were cutting out all religious elements, but used exactly the same background or sim very similar background. And these pictures actually come from the inside of the original uh, cover. So this was, of course, censorship. And I talked to the designer why, what was going on. And he said it was just something that you knew you had to do. Nobody actually told him, but you were doing the redesign and this was the translation. Um, another thing, and that is probably the only thing that is re registered as punitive censorship, is that no people were taken to court, according to my knowledge, for translating. So there was no book taken to court, no book banned in court. This was a film locally produced and it's called Plastic Jesus. And it actually made it to two festivals before someone remembered that it's not really, that it's controversial for some reason. And the author was sentenced to three years in prison. That is probably the only example that someone actually uh, ended up in jail for, for uh, having religious elements. This is not promoting religion, so just to make it clear. On the other hand, so we have a lot of examples of control and uh, well, flat out censorship in popular culture, while critical uh, uh, theory and political writing, you could find huge circulations of almost all of the major the Marxist writers from the West. That was unthinkable in Poland or the Soviet Union at the time. But that was actually the uh, outcome of our research that we did uh, with uh, Catherine Batchelor, because the three of us were doing the second world, meaning the Eastern Europe, and uh, the Polish and the Soviet results were completely different from what I could find. So uh, that was another thing to consider, and I, uh, uh, I actually, believe that it is because of the Praxis School of Philosophy, which seemed so small at the beginning, but actually spread so far in the end. Um, so the role of the human agent is also something critical in uh, translation history studies. Uh, in uh, translating critical theory, it is not the translator, it is the editor who is the key figure for most editions. Uh, so to conclude, I think, I should do that, yeah? Well, we detected different levels of pressure, and it actually relates to who the audiences were, the material were. And uh, also, uh, at different periods in history, the pressure was uh, more or less uh, present. And uh, we also found out that it is necessary to rethink the concept of censorship. So censorship as, as a word, bears a very negative meaning and uh, assumes a body outside of those who produce the text, but it is proven that it is not the case. Censorship exists from the inside. Uh, another interesting uh, concept that uh, actually involves translation, cu is, uh, translation culture, which involves uh, most of the people uh, involved and so the translator, the norms, the conventions, the expectations, but also the behavior and the controlling mechanisms uh, that actually create a set of translations or the translation as an idea in a particular culture. So what I found most important or most interesting is that we are able to set aside this source target binary and get better results or get results that make more sense in the current circumstances. Uh, that uh, translation histories also point to language changes, whether they are done artificially or for ideological reasons or for political reasons or for just evolution of language reasons. Uh, that uh, this kind of studies actually point to the translators that used to be invisible or the, the, their uh, uh, profiles were invisible and their profiles actually influenced the production of translations and that it uh, allows for the recording of the movement through space, so which came from where. 
Um, I just did not mention it, but the original in the Serbian translation actually meant from English. Because at the time, most of the translations of Shakespeare, first translations were done from German and from German adaptations. So the original is a completely different meaning at the time. So, and we can detect what came through German became something that was translated, performed, but proven unsatisfactory. And then they went for the original or for the English versions of the text. Okay, some references, and thank you very much for being so patient.